Um, <laughs> So I was interested. I mean, it's hard to do the. I mean, it's hard to do. You've to, to, to take an idea like that and do it. So I, I tried to do it like that. I tried to do it in Australia, mm -hmm. in Gippsland, where my father had sold Fords to, to dairy farmers. Mm -hmm. uh, and finally, this sort of worked. So maybe if it hadn't have worked, I would have gone off to write another novel, and that would have stayed there as something that I was still trying to do that I hadn't found a way to do. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. thing, the thing about the duck becoming the swan. So part of the book is set in, 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 in the Black Forest and, and fairy tales seem to come up. And, and you've got a, here we have a story where the duck becomes a swan and that would seem to relate to all of that sort of storytelling. But in fact, what happened was the duck, uh, I couldn't really, I was talking to the, a, a conservator at the Victoria and Albert in London and she's very helpful about all sorts of things. And, uh, She's the person who told me how, how creepy it was to, to restore an automaton, mm -hmm, and how mm -hmm. she and working on a particular one had to put a paper bag over its head because she just couldn't but bear its sort of creepy, mm -hmm. dead, undead sort of quality. Um, but she said, well, I don't know anything much about this, this duck, but have you, have you seen, there's a wonderful silver swan at the Bose Museum. And I said, well, Great, where, where can I see that? And she says, well, you, you just go to YouTube and you type in Silver Swan, <laughs> <laughs> which I did. And there it was, and it was a gorgeous, beautiful thing. And it was really, really gorgeous. And when you, you'll see this when you type in Silver Swan, when you go home, <laughs> you can see it too. Maybe if you're gonna read the book, maybe you should read the book first and type that in later. But um, the wonderful thing that happened was that they just restored the swan which means, and they had a record of it, and it was online. Day one, we did this, we took this thing out of the, day two, day three, day four, I think there were about 40 days invo involved in the pulling it down and re restoration of it. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty fabulous. How am I gonna do without this swan? Because I'm not that I'm interested, I'm a mechanic, but I have to know what my characters want to do. And that's not that I'm interested in the, in the cold parts, but rather that those parts will be imbued with the character's feelings and so on. And, and then you see there's the guy, the horologist. Now I'd never, I really never heard of horology to tell you the truth, <laughs> but here I am, the expert on horology. And, and I talked to the horologist, and this man called Matthew Reed, who is very, very sort of plain spoken, Northern English man who said, this is all nonsense, people think this is all romantic, it's not it's just a job. But that was not really true. Mm -hmm. and, but he, but it, uh, he was terrifically helpful. So when I wanted to, when I wanted to figure out, you know, when, when Catherine would come into her workroom so mm -hmm. after this and find what's there, I'm saying, Matthew, I want it in boxes. Mm -hmm. Well, what sort of boxes and how many? Tea chests, he said, you need tea chests. And so I said, how many? And what other sort of packing materials would I have? So, so there's the swan. I've got to have the swan. But on the other hand, I already have the duck. <laughs> <laughs> and the duck's sort of wonderful. And, and, and how Henry Brandling finds the, the thing in the London Illustrated News, you know, it's already quite old, the duck, at the time that the plans are reproduced. And how he shows it to his son and how he's, his sick son who has consumption. Um, and the little boy likes it very much. And his wife is trying to get Henry out of the house, mm -hmm. basically kicking him out, basically. And she says, well, you've made the, the child want, the, want this thing, so you better go and get it. He said, I have to go to Europe. And she says, well, I'm sure you know how best to do this. And so he's sort of kicked out. So, so then what's going to happen, he's going to go looking for the duck and he's going to get a swan. So that's sort of interesting to me. And that then suggests that suggests a character because there's somebody in the middle of the, the person who is meant to make the duck won't make the duck. They're going to make a swan. So that's the beginning of Sumpa's character because he's that sort of mad, megalomaniacal, grandiose mm -hmm. artist sort of person who thinks that patrons should just shut up and, and don't worry what they want, take what they're given. And, and uh, so that's a... So it's pragmatic. Mm -hmm. I've, I'm not going to lose the duck. I want the swan. I see a swan. I see a duck's becoming a swan, mm -hmm. and that's interesting. And I sense a character in the middle who's going to affect it. You have, you have, in 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 many of your books, um, you have looked back upon um, 
historical events. Mm. Um, but they, the books have also kind of dealt with um, history as kind of an act of cre creation, an act of the imagination. Um, and um, uh, I'm wondering what it is um, about history that fascinates you? Is it just something that you can see more clearly, or is it our contemporary relationship with history that interests you? Yes, I mean, people say, you know, why are you interested in the 19th century? And I would say, because we're living in it. And uh, we're living in the consequences of the 19th century every day. Remember, yes. you know, so it's, a, it's a great 19th century notion about the economy, that growth is fantastic. And uh, that that's what we need. And, and in fact, the New York Times is still in the 19th century because it's continuing to report. Uh, last quarter's growth figures were fantastic. And at the same time, in the 21st century, we know that we're already, that growth is killing us and that we're treating the planet as if it's already at one and a half times the size that it is. And something's going to break very soon if we keep on doing this. So we're living even while we're acknowledging all of the environmental problems of, of, of growth, we're, 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 the, the dominant conversation about growth is, is, uh, is a sort of a 19th century economic notion. And I don't think when you look at these things, I, I think the right, the right really understands what, <laughs> what this would mean if we were to really accept mm -hmm. that growth is killing us. And they can see the consequences and that make, it is an impossible thing for them to believe or accept because it would destroy everything that they have. So they can't accept that it will happen. Mm -hmm. And I don't think the left really knows what to do about it, frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe somebody does know, and I, but people seem not to talk about that, a, a future without growth, really. Maybe, maybe there are people that are doing that. They're probably in Canada, I guess. <laughs> One of the, um, the, the unfolding events that is taking place um, as Catherine is attempting to deal with her grief, but also to unpackage and, 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 uh, and uh, reconstruct the, what will become um, the swan is, of course, the oil spill taking place mm. uh, in the spring of 2010. And I'm just interested, that's probably the most explicit connection um, that you make in the book between 19th century notions of progress and their consequences in the present day. And I'm wondering, I don't think of your books in terms of them kind of announcing to me in any way sort of what they're about or um, mm. what's, what's bothering you. And I'm wondering how you, how you work through those, those kinds of parallels, those kinds of ideas, yet still weave them within what you consider to be something people want to I read. I don't know. It was sort of... It was as if the oil industry just couldn't shut up and had to draw, draw my attention to it. Right. It was a, I don't normally accept gifts from oil companies, but it, it, <laughs> in, in that case, that, was, that, that, one. that happened when I was writing the book. Yes, yeah. And, uh, one, and it fit very well. I mean, the day that Matthew dies is yeah. the day of the oil spill. Yeah. Um, but we... we we, you mentioned earlier uh, my first published novel, Bliss, before mm -hmm. we came on. Mm -hmm. And I said, I, I don't know how that stands up. You better not tell me. And, um, <laughs> but thinking, there's a lot of parallels between Bliss and, and, and this book. And, and Bliss, was a, Bliss was a novel that was really seriously concerned about the environment. Bliss, the people in, 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 in Bliss were worried about environmental cancer. In, in Bliss, there are cancer maps which everybody who read it at the time thought was hippy-dippy bullshit. Mm -hmm. But in fact, we know all about it. I'm too much about environmental cancer now. Mm -hmm. So, I, so I, I, it just occurred to me, this is me being interested in myself, by the way. Yeah, first We're on stage, novel. so go ahead. Yeah, it's fine. It's OK. <laughs> Enough. Yes, go on. <laughs> Next. <laughs> but no, 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 go on. Seriously. Well, it's that you think you've come to some conclusion or you, that you're now saying something you haven't said before and then you yes. realise realize the first novel you wrote was actually concerned with you know, similar matters of you know, in pollution, industrialisation. Well, I would say that it's perfectly legitimate that certain kind of deep concerns would be sort of abiding. You, you, don't, you don't tend to work those things out per thing no. in one book. It right? was originally called Waiting for the Barbarians, by the way. Really? <laughs> and that other fellow... Yeah. <laughs> that other fellow's publisher 
mm -hmm. called my publisher and said, your fellow can't do this because my fellow's already got that. So there. And then I had to find another title overnight. But Waiting for the Barbarians seemed to be a really good framing thing for what I right. was doing with the book, right. which is you know, they're, they're, uh, they have a sort of a solution while they're waiting for the mm -hmm. barbarians, but they are still waiting, you know. And, 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 it, and it's not that I would say that there is in any way a, a kind of, in any way, a, a simplistic notion of, of either technology or progress at work in the book. And in fact, um, it, one of the, when it, uh, you get towards the end of the book, there is a very, very articulate and passionate defense um, which is uh, stated for ambiguity and for not overanalyzing um, and nailing things down. So I'm not going to do that. But what interests me... You can try. I'm, I, <laughs> I, do, I, do my best, I do my best. But what, 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 what's interesting to me is that, is that even the, the, our, our relationship with technology, you could argue that there is something perhaps in the human spirit that needs to create machinery, that needs to create these tools outside of ourselves that are extensions of our own, our own, kinds, of, our own kinds of powers, and that these things can be both positive and negative. And the amazing thing, of course, about, about the duck and about the swan is that as a kind of a, 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 you know, a meeting of absolute whimsy and complete insane meticulousness, mm. it's kind mm. of so, I'm not sure where I'm going with this, with the question, well, and I'm, I'm hoping it might spark some kind of interesting response from you. Well, uh, I was, or maybe a novel. I, can go I, 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 I was thinking that if you, we, we, our love of technology and our great creativity. Well, I, right. I, I think that we are yet to face when we decide we're going to stop living like this, right. and when we decide we're in dire peril, right. and we're prepared to do anything not to do lethal damage to ourselves, mm -hmm. then might be the time to see our creativity working mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To, for, to, to, as if our lives depended upon it, and then who knows what we'll be able to do and if we can do anything. Is there, um, when you look um, around today at our use of technology, and now it, of course it is so kind of integrated with everything that we do and it is available to us, in, at every moment of the day, and we can carry it in our pockets, and we can mm. find out anything we want. And just in the last few days, is why I wanted, was mm. I wanted to research Peter Carey or anything mentioned in this book. It was right there at sort of mm. my fingertips. Um, do you see anything positive about the kind of technology, technological world we live in today? Well, I don't know. Yes, no. Uh, it, it's it's uh, certainly incredibly addictive. Yes. And, yes. Um, yes. I, I, and I think that's something that we're really not looking at the consequences of. And yes, we can find out a whole lot of things quickly. Uh, I'm, but I wasn't sort of, were we sitting around thinking, you know, that the intellectual life in the 18th century was so appalling. Mm -hmm. Now we have to invent some machinery so we can be smarter and better and brighter and da da da. We probably don't mm -hmm. really need this. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing, the, the thing that happens with technology, and you can see this happening you know, with, with e-books, for instance. You, first you have the invention, and then we've all got to get shit kicked out of us and, and, until we find a way to use it. And, and so I think it's often the people, the people who are driving the technology are not the people who are going to end up using it. If you want to look at the people who, who are sort of really concerned with the you know, devices and the books, they're not really interested in reading. Mm -hmm. But they're really affecting the lives of people who do read and how they read and what's, and what's available to them. And, and it affects the lives of artists who make things. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and it probably determines that the artists are paid less and are less able to support themselves. Mm -hmm. So we, it's fun, of course, but, you know, I'm sure heroin's a lot of fun too. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, and yeah. otherwise wouldn't be popular. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and... Uh, mm -hmm. So I think a lot of technology is just, but it's a very big, it's a very small word to describe so many different things. Absolutely. And how can we possibly, you know, I think it's a bad question. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you've at least, at least dignified it by calling it a question. I, 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 appreciate, I appreciate that. Um, I, I, I told someone that I would, I, that, uh, um, that I would pursue this, but, um, and we talked a little bit about it backstage, and, it, and it, it's concerning the true history of the Kelly Gang. Um, and it is, a, it is a book that um, over the years um, it has been suggested to me and I have felt many times um, 
begs some kind of cinematic treatment or adaptation. Now, I know that's not your business, but uh, can you tell me whether or not that might be in the offing? Well, yes, it might be in the offing. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and we'll come to that, but I, I did want to talk about the question of begging it because, I mean, if you, if you love movies and making movies, then you, can, uh, then you can read that book and think something interesting could be done with it. Yes, yes. But it is, and yes, there is a chance that something is about to happen, mm -hmm. but it is really, it's a, it's, it's a work of language. Yes. And the one thing I know, having talked to people, and good people, who are talking about making a film, the first decision you've really got to make when you make the movie of this is that it's not, it's not about that voice, it's not about those words, it's not about the, word, the way the words might sing and make a sort of a, a poetry of the voiceless, which would be my sort of ambition for it. Mm -hmm. So all that has to go. And what's sort of left is... I suppose a sort of a, a re my reimagining of the history of the characters and their meaning and so on. So firstly, it kills the book, or yes. it doesn't kill it, but it has a separate life. And, yeah. and one should acknowledge that the book continues to exist, and if there's a film, it will exist, and it yes. won't. It won't be the book. The the it nearly happened once before. Um, uh, on, um, what did I, I told you, Neil Neil Jordan. Neil Jordan, yeah. yes, yeah. Neil Jordan, yeah. the Irish filmmaker, optioned this book when it came out, and I was so excited, the notion of these broken threads of migration and uh, would be sort of joined again between Australia and Ireland, and there'd be Irish actors and Australian actors, and there'd be an Australian landscape and an Irish director, and uh, who, uh, who also had the great benefit of, 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 of being interested in cross-dressing, which, which is, does happen in, in the book. So I thought this was gonna be a pretty wild sort of a Film. And unfortunately, another film was made of the Kelly Gang at that time, which didn't do well. And because mm -hmm. it didn't do well, that one failed. Now there are, there's a, a wonderful English uh, producer called David Orkin, who was at Film 4, and who Louise knows, I can see. And, um, <laughs> and um, he's gone about this business of making this film very slowly and really carefully and meticulously. You know, where he talked with me, and then he turned up with a screenwriter who lives in England but, but comes from Australia. And then he found this Australian director who made this sort of film that I'm, I can't watch all of because it's too upsetting, but it's called The Snowtown Murders or Snowtown. And he's clearly a really, really, really good director who's Australian. So he's putting this thing together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's been no contract signed yet, mm -hmm. <laughs> but probably, Probably there'll be a, you know, a, 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 it probably will be in the next few weeks. And then it'll, it might happen or it might not happen. Right, yeah. Um, while we um, prepare for the, uh, the next part of the evening, which is when we turn it over uh, for your questions, um, for Mr. Carey, uh, tell me a little bit about um, what's on your mind now. What's the internal combustion moment of inspiration at the moment that you're thinking about? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, I'm, I'm well into writing a book which begins in, it's all set in Australia, begins in about 1942, ends in the present time, seems to be about three generations of women, although that wasn't really what I set out to think about. And it's got an awful lot to do with uh, the United States and its relationship with Australia. And uh, it's got some previously unknown facts. <laughs> <laughs> and is this something that you've been thinking about for a long time? Uh, something like 40 years, yes. 40 years, oh, okay. <laughs>